together. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, uh, sorry, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped round him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And may the Lord add much blessing to the reading of his word. Allow it will comfort us as well. If we allow it, it will change us. It will change the way you think about your whole life. <laughs> Did you expect that when you walked in today? How am I going to have my life story rewritten so it matters on into eternity? Well, that's what we're looking at today, people. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord, please, would you come and attend the preaching of your word? We want to see Jesus. We want to look at Christ. We want our minds to be filled with what he knows and he sees and he does and he directs. And we want our hearts to be caught up with a kind of love that changes the world. So please, would you do that in us? Would you do that through us? Through the simplicity of us hearing your precious word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I saw one of these internet memes earlier this week. And it was being spoken by somebody who was more than a little bit jaded by some of the treatment that she had received. Clearly she had people who had said one thing about themselves and done something very different. And the simple quote was, I don't care what people say, I will know them by what they do. And of course we could pull that apart and we could look at it and we could explore it. But there is something about the fact that Christ tells us things, but then he more than backs them up. If you want to know what God is like, look at what he does. Look at what he does. It will reveal his character. It will tell you of him. And on this night before Christ goes to the cross, in John chapter 13, we're going to see what Jesus knows, what Jesus did, what Jesus says, and what Jesus directs. What Jesus knows, what Jesus does, what Jesus says, and what Jesus directs. So number one, what Jesus knew. Well, let's look down there at verses one through to three. It was just before the Passover festival or feast. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Can you imagine the tension in his heart and experience? 
Remember, he is the one who is sent from heaven and will be returning to heaven. But all of the days have been moving in this direction and it's go time. This is the hour. In fact, he says, it says there, Jesus knew. He knew that this was why he has come. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to his father, but the route through would be via the cross. And we find him later on this evening trembling at the prospect of it. And what's he got to do in the middle of it? Go and have a family meal. Many of us would sort of RSVP, I can't be bothered, don't you know what I've got on my mind? Many of us would be thinking, I've got to go and sit with them again, they are so high maintenance. But he knew what was happening and he knew his hour. He also knew who would be there. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Iscariot, to betray him. Have you ever had those really awkward moments when you're sitting down at a family meal and there is some unresolved tension that is there? And you really don't know how you're going to love on that person. And here is Jesus and he wasn't all sort of middle class smiles pretending to be nice but really inside seething and hating. He was sitting in the room and going to be sitting in the sort of circle, not quite table. I mean, I know, I know there was the famous uh, painting of The Last Supper. Have you seen it? Who was it? Was it Michelangelo who did that painting? They wouldn't have been sitting at a table. They would have been reclining. They probably would have had like cushions and beds there. And every time he looked up, he would have seen the one that he had loved on, who had been with him for three years, the guy who would be a traitor and a turncoat. Would you want to go into that environment? And this is, by the way, the end, the, the, well, nearly the end of the week that hadn't been great. It had been one full of conflict. It had been one where people were out to get him. On Monday of this week, remember it's Thursday, on Monday of this week he had been in the temple and he had had to cleanse the temple because none of them had regard whatsoever for the glories of God at work in, in, in that nation and on into their lives. And so he turns over the tables of the money changes and he upholds the, the glory of God. And that would have been exhausting enough. But the Tuesday, he goes into attention points with loads of the religious leaders around. And they are out to get him. And they know that the wanted posters are up. There is a price on his head. They want shut. And they've already hatched their plans to send him off to the Romans. He is in the middle of the ultimate conflict situation. And the place where he would hope he would get a little bit of respite is at this meal. And, of course, all of their emotional junk comes out. Anybody ever been to a family meal and thought, oh no, this could go sideways really quickly? And in the other Gospels, that's exactly what we find. Because they're sitting at the table, despite the fact that Jesus has told them what is coming up over the next few days, he has pre-warned them, he has prepared them. What are they talking about? How they can get behind him? How they can support him? How they can encourage them? No! It's like going back to a bunch of two-year-olds. They're squabbling about who should be the greatest. Peter's like, well, I'm his favorite. And Bartholomew speaks up and go, I'm sure people will remember my name. And as you know, of all the disciples, which name gets forgotten the most? <laughs> Bartholomew. It was utterly childish. And they're squabbling over who would be the greatest. And what is it that Jesus knows? He knows the very nature of people. He has been on the receiving end of it. We're told here that, verse 2, the evening meal was in progress and it was... And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. He's in the middle of the conflict situation and the disciples are acting like two-year-olds. They're squabbling over who will be greatest. It is childish, it is petty. He knew how broken with self-importance and pride the world was. How little it esteemed the glory of God. How the heart of mankind just turned in the direction of pride. And this very meal was a microcosm of the whole of humanity. And Jesus had enough on his plate, didn't he? They should have been bowing and worshipping, but instead they were big upping themselves. They're a picture of the human heart. And in each one of our hearts, there is a constant growing subtle lust for power and recognition. We measure a moment and a circumstance by how we think it will make us feel and whether we can get ahead through it. 
whether we can get some sort of either personal credit in our own eyes or in the eyes of others. That's why we don't want to go to a meal where we know it's going to be high maintenance, because what kind of people do we want to be around? Easy and low maintenance people. And I love this phrase here, it's just wonderful. Looking upon what he sees, verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. He's the main event. He's the Lord of glory come from the Father, about to go back to the Father. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. And in that moment with the petulance and the pettiness, and the pe- you know you can even buy a t- t-shirt these days that written on the front says, I'm the boss. Doesn't that tell you enough about the human heart? I don't want to serve, I want to be served. I want to put people around me who will build up my capital. I want to look imp- impressive in the eyes of everybody else. I want my life to be about me, and yet we're reading here that in the midst of their presence, there was the one who it is all about, all authority in heaven and on earth, and he's amongst the party of the petulant two-year-olds. What would you do if you've got all that power? Some of you parents have had those moments, haven't you? When you've prepared your kids in the Sunday best and you've gone out somewhere nice and you're just thinking, just for this one half an hour, can you act like civilized human beings? And you're somewhere out in public and you've taught them and you've been with them and you've loved upon them and they're just bickering and petty and squabbling and this ugly self-centeredness and the refusal to do anything if it doesn't benefit them starts bubbling out in in public. If you're a parent and your kids are are doing that, what do you want to do with them? Say your prayers. And an indignation because you've got the power as the parent. You just want to squish them. Have you got no idea how ugly that is? And so for me, this great moment in this passage is bam, bam, bam. It's like John is building it up. He's like, do you know the mess of the ugliness of the human heart? They've got proud hearts and dirty feet. And Jesus sees this and goes... Well, what does he do? Second of all, what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do in that moment where he's bearing the weight of the world literally? He sees proud hearts and dirty feet, and in the midst of all the self importance, verse 4. So he got up from the meal and. I wonder whether there was a glimmer in Peter's eye as he saw Jesus get up. And a moment of conscience like tweaks in Peter and he's like, "Uh uh-oh, we've overstepped the mark here. And Jesus is about to quieten us down. Was Jesus, as he got up, about to go, in the name of all that is right and holy, shut up! But he doesn't speak. He just does. Verse 4, he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. He assumed the position of a servant in the midst of all the self-importance. He wrapped a towel around his waist and after that he went and found himself a bowl and he tipped water into it and all the eyes are on him going what on earth is he going to do is he going to launch it at somebody probably what they deserve and he began to wash his disciples feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him it's about to get awkward in here because I've got a bowl of water and I need a volunteer. I did actually think about doing that. (coughs) But just by me even suggesting that I might, what did it do in you? Did it make any of you feel awkward? There's something about, I'm in the feet there, the, wo- the roads back then weren't very nice, and the standard practice would be that when you went for a meal, when you welcomed visitors, 
you would offer them the chance of cleaning off their feet. Why? Because it was about the fact. In many ways, to cover the shame. Um, many of us don't like our feet to be seen because they're not the most pretty parts of us, are they? But when you've been walking on those roads through the mud, through the dust, and through the dung, they're really not very pleasant. And when you go to a meal at these kind of places and you recline, what happens is you recline on these sort of semi-cushions in a sort of circle area, and you're sort of on one side like that, dipping your food in there, and maybe you lean on your head or you lean on your elbow like that, and your feet are near where? The next person's head. Not particularly present, pleasant. So it was assumed and expected that there would be the means by which the feet would have been cleaned. And it seems that, for whatever reason, their feet still needed to be cleaned. But because they were so busy squabbling about who was the most important, none of them had taken care of the business, none of them had sorted out. And as Jesus looks upon them and sees proud hearts and dirty feet, he cannot help himself. He gets up from the table. He takes off. Nobody made him do it. And it wasn't to shame them, though they would have been shamed. He did it because he loves to serve. You see, when you come near to the Lord Jesus and he serves you, what before, this is the dynamic of how he works in our heart. He could have stood up and said, wash their feet. Remember, all authority is his. But he's not that kind of leader. He's a servant. He gets up, and he doesn't go, oh, I'll do it then, like some of you grumpily do at family meals when everybody's doing your head in. He gets up, and he goes and washes, his feet, uh, washes their feet because he wants to, with all the chaos going on around, with all the prospect of what is going to be ahead of him within a matter of hours. He is moving towards others to love upon them. Please notice, nobody undressed him. Nobody said, oi, get up. He did it at his own initiative. He took stuff off to make himself available. So here's the question for us as we look at this. We're always putting conditions on this and our preferences and deciding, oh, no, this is how much I should give and no more. The question that this leaves us as we look at what he did is, what are you willing to set aside and take off? For the good of others. He took, took off his garments because he wanted to serve. And when it comes to service, there is no service without sacrifice. And you can bet it was awkward because they were being shamed in the same moment, even though he wasn't trying to. Because when you see that kind of love, it immediately invites you to shift your way of seeing absolutely everything verse 5 again after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them and all they could do was experience what was flowing from Christ to them out of a heart of love now this has some, a few implications for us Jesus was so secure in who he was that he could do that even in the presence of his enemies. Who was one of the people reclining there whose feet Jesus washed? Now listen, I know in life there are many people who do really horrible things to you. But Judas is a name that no parent wants to name their kid after. They may not know the names of many of the other disciples, but they know the name of Judas. And they know him because he is infamous for being a traitor, a turncoat, and a betrayer. And without missing a beat, Jesus goes to that one who is treating him as an enemy, and he serves him in the most humiliating of public ways. Roman slaves, by law, weren't allowed to be made to do that job. 
And the Romans didn't mind treating their slaves badly. And Jesus assumed that and he washed the feet of his enemies. He found a way to serve. He saw their proud hearts and their dirty feet and says, I'm going to get involved, I'm going to move towards. Why? Because he was so secure. We, we may get confused about who Jesus is. He isn't. And, so, and please, can I, I liberate some of us, because some of us don't want to serve because we think we're too important. Others of us, and it's a subtle difference, don't want to serve because we view serving and loving on other people in some way makes us subservient, an identity issue. I'm lower than them. There is nobody bigger than the Lord Jesus. He has all authority. He has come from the Father. He's going back to the Father. His name echoes into eternity. So one thing that can't be true is that serving is subservient. You could argue that if you want to see somebody's greatness, watch the way they serve. And right now, maybe you're experiencing what I did as I just looked upon the simplicity of this action right now, I felt, what am I doing with my life? I spend so much of my time trying to build my own capital, pursue my own self-interest and have things my way, expecting my name to be lifted up. And yet this one, Jesus Christ, came. What did he do? I just look upon it. What did he do? He took the place of a servant. Not begrudgingly. Freely. And maybe I shouldn't, but I want to be like that. Does anybody hear? Has it made you question what you've got in a, your knickers in a twist in over the last few days? What you've had a tizzy over? Some of us are in close relationships, maybe marriage or friendship. And we throw our weight around because they haven't served us how we think they should. Just run every argument, difficulty or frustration of the last week that you've had with somebody else back through this grid. Are you feeling silly yet? It's chicken feed. It's silly. Because when you know who you are, you're not thrown off by your enemies. You're not trying to play some, I've got to get ahead game. You are freed up to serve. The more you think of trying to big up yourself, the lower you will be. But the more that you are secure in who you are, the more you can just give away freely. That's what Jesus did. But then, it's not done because there's what Jesus said. Nothing has been said verbally until we get to these verses here where Peter, and it's always Peter, isn't it? Maybe you're like him. It's always Peter. Verse 6, he then came to Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Now, I'm not quite sure what Peter's understanding was at this point. All he knew was he felt awkward and he knew something that wasn't right. Did he mean, hold on, this is out of sync. You, you, you're the master. I should be washing your feet. Maybe he was just like, no, 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 I, I, no, 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 no. I, I can wash my own feet, thank you very much, which is the, the basic attitude that is pretty standard in local churches. Yeah, we like the idea of revering Jesus, and what we'll do is we'll clean ourselves up to bring ourselves into his presence. I don't quite know what was going on with Peter. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? But it was... If he was going to move forward from this moment, he was going to have to wrestle with the awkwardness of it. Are you prepared to wrestle with the awkwardness of a Jesus who, who, who says, I need to wash your feet? Are you going to put up a fight? Are you going to say, no, 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 I'll wash my own feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing. But later you will understand because he was tying this moment to the fullness of all that Jesus brings that can only be seen through the lens of the cross, where Christ went and carried our, 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 our ugliness, our dirtiness, our sin against the holy God, our self-importance, our pride. And he dealt with it in such a way that we would not be scarred, marred, or dirtied by it anymore in the eyes of heaven. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. 
And there's something in you and there's something in me that, that wants to say that with Peter, isn't there? We want to be able to say, I don't need cleansing because I've got it all straight and I've nailed this one. I'm living my best life now and me and God, we're good because I've lived up to it. There are some of you who sat here hearing about the grace of God coming at you through Jesus for months before you gave up that one. It's almost as if you were saying to the Lord again and again and again, no, 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 you will never wash my feet. And the Lord looks down upon you with grace and with mercy as he looked at Peter right now in that moment and just goes, you have no idea, but you'll understand one day. Have you any idea how much you need me? Which means for those of you who are sort of early on this journey, you need to understand what this is telling us about the very nature of the Christian, the Christian faith, the Christian message. Because there is this perception out there that I am a Christian because of something that I bring to God. So in other words, it's flowing from me to God and then I get some sort of blessing dumped on my life. That's not the Christian gospel. Somebody put it this way. Some people view the Christian message today as here are the rules, see how many you can keep. I.e. I'll wash my own feet, I'll make myself clean. But the Christian gospel message is here is Jesus See what God has done for you through him. Which way is it all flowing? I'm going to wash your feet. And you're going to put up a fight. And I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to wash your feet. And in a rare moment of logic for Peter, (laughs) he starts to think it through. Can you see what he says? (laughs) Jesus answered, unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. In other words, you... You can't serve me unless I first served you. You need to live out of what I will do for you. You need me to wash you in ways you have got no idea. And then uh, then Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. He's like, I surrender. I don't know the full extent of it, but I know that I need to receive much more than I need to do. Whatever it is you're bringing, I need that. If this is to do with your salvation, Jesus, from the top of my head to the bottom of my soles and my feet, I want the fullness of all of it. And Jesus answers with these enigmatic words here. Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. In other words, you're already caught up in the cleansing that I'm bringing. But you need to live out of it day by day. Another fat Baptist pastor from the 18th century, very well known, Spurgeon his name was. He, just, he preached a few verses just on this small little section. And he, in those chapters, talked about something that many Bible-believing Christians forget on a day-by-day basis. They assume and know, and rightly so, cling to the fact that in Christ I have new life, I have been forgiven, the old has gone, the new has come, I'm in his family... But Spurgeon says, there's something available to Christians that would revolutionize their life if they made it something daily. You've had a bath, but do we go to the Lord at the end of the day and ask him to renew his cleansing for all that's happened that day? And then we do that every day. We keep going back to the Lord saying, I want to live in the fullness of the experience of what I have objectively got from you, I want to enjoy being able to bring my sin to you and and know on the promise of your word that I am cleansed and forgiven for this day. And then I'll come back to you when I mess up and I've got the same prideful self-importance the next day and I've misspoken and I've mistreated. I'm going to come back to you and say, Lord, cleanse me afresh. I know I've had a bath. I'm made clean. But I want to relate this to you. Remember what prayer is? We've been talking a lot about this in our fellowship group. Prayer is speaking to the Lord about what he has said to us. And maybe some of you need to put that into your daily routine. Of saying, I'm going to walk in the cleansing. I'm going to interact with the living God over how he cleanses me every single day. Now, why would that be important for some of you? It would be important because some of you live in the prison cell of your own shame. 
Do you know what I'm talking about? A sense that you don't measure up. A sense that you failed again. By whatever stat set of standards, you compare yourself with people around and you wonder why you're not growing more. You wonder why you, those same old habits keep on coming back and you haven't got a sense of freedom from sin in a way that you'd hope for. And the way that you speak to your kids and the way that you spend your money and the things that you look at online, nobody else knows, you keep it quiet, but you feel dirtied by it. And Jesus comes and says, I'm going to wash your feet. And we reply, are you going to wash my feet? And he's like, if you want to walk in this newness of life, you need to bring what carries, what, what, What locks you away in shame? Bring your feet with all the muck. Bring your heart with all the self-importance. And let me declare over you today, tomorrow, the next day. Keep coming back to me because you're going to need to hear me say it. Keep coming back to know my cleansing from all that is dirty in your life. Because that's what you need me for. Jesus answered those, those who have had a bath need only wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. And the editor adds in John, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. So we've seen what Jesus knows. We've seen what Jesus did. We've seen what Jesus says. And finally, let's see what he directs. And I wish I'd got a whole sermon on this, but I I can't do it. So let's look at verses 12. When he had finished washing their feet... He put on his clothes and returned to his place. And can I say this? This whole moment in this supper is like a picture of his whole ministry. He is dressed and he is at the table. And then he descends and condescends himself. He takes off his robes, just like the the period of his earthly ministry. He goes and gets the lowest place. And then when his ministry of serving and cleansing is done, he gets back up. He is robed again, and he takes his proper place. And so that's a picture, if you like, of his whole life and ministry, which, by the way, shines a light on what your life could be about. How do you view your life now? Do you view it as sitting at the table, fully dressed? That's what I want to do. What period of life am I supposed to be in right now? Is it the sat at the table fully dressed or is it the washing the feet? It's such a joy to have Jyoti and Shusmita with us because they're a little bit further on in years and they've been serving. They've been giving their life away in a different context, facing oppression, being despised in the eyes of the world and serving Christ, serving little mouths and I pick on them because they're our visitors but in our room here we've got people who have put off certain things in order that they can see themselves for this three score year and ten don't know how long you're going to live but are you like me and need to be reminded that that's the phase I'm in right now I just want to serve myself I was speaking to a pastor who rang me the other day and he said, Steve, how are you doing? I said, I'm in absolutely distraught. What are you distraught about? I've been seeing Jesus wash people's feet. Shouldn't you be excited about that? I am, but the next bit tells me that for me to be authentically human, who he has made me to be, I'm supposed to strip myself down and view my whole life, not just Sundays, not just during Speak Kids, or not just when I'm preparing a sermon, or not just when somebody needs something. I'm supposed to see my whole life in that phase. How do you feel about the prospect of that? Oh, you're conflicted, aren't you? On the one hand, you want to be able to look back on whatever period of time you're given and know that you left it all out in the field for Jesus don't you I served and I gave and I didn't value what the world values and I loved what was precious in his sight and I cared not for my own sake 
but I was more bothered about the service of others and loving in his name so that he got all the glory. You want that, but on the, on the other hand, you also want what I want, which is a comfortable, easy, convenient life where the people who are around me are low maintenance and serve me. Can I tell you, if you're feeling the conflict, that's not all bad. Because it means that this one who keeps on serving you, even though you're conflicted, is at work in your heart. But it means we, that we need to go to him. And we need to go to him and say, would you please bring this change into my life so that I am, my first thought is to get up from the table and cast off whatever's in the way of serving and loving on other people. So that my first thought is, I don't even want to be part of the power games and the make my name great games. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And I, in case you haven't noticed this because they've got nice fancy Nike trainers on right now, there's a lot of muck on your neighbor's feet. Can you imagine how it would change next Saturday when we have our not so away day? We don't walk in thinking, uh, I'm the guest. And that lot, or whoever's standing at the front, is the host. You walk in thinking, I'm the host. They're the guests. I'm going to spend my Saturday loving on everybody else in the midst of their muck and mess. I'm going to move towards and get to know and make myself vulnerable and love. Can you imagine what we'd be like as a church community here? We'd be the very opposite of the people in Speak. Because here in Speak, all they ever do is complain about how somebody didn't do the right thing by them. Whereas in here, we'll be a community who are seeking out the people who don't do right by us in order to love on them. Even if that person is the person you're married to. The little slights and the little put-offs will... Because he has set us an example that knows no limits. I mean, some, some of you might go, I just don't know whether I can do that for you, Jesus. And you sort of build this idea of this is what service looks like. Well, as long as I give that hour then and that. No, no, service, service genuine from the heart will always involve sacrifice. It will never come at the right moment and it will come at the point where you don't feel like you've got any more to give. I spoke to another Christian brother this, this week who's in the process of going through a painful breakup in his church situation. And he is exhausted and he is weary. And I tell you what stood out for me as I listened to him. Even though he is being mistreated, even though many of the things that he held dear are being systematically disassembled in front of him through no fault of his own and through the malicious intent of other people, his heart was, how do I serve my enemies? And I knew what it cost him to want to do that. And I knew how muddled and confused it was making to try and figure it out. I said, how are you going to do that? And he said, I'm just going to keep on seeking the Lord and asking that he give me a heart of love. And maybe that is all that you can do. I suspect that today's Bible message, for some people in the room, will give you a sense of, no, do you know what? I need to lay that specific thing down. To give, to serve, to love. To create space so that I can be who Christ has called me to be, a servant of the, this kind of Jesus in this generation. But for others of you, you won't have a clue what it will look like. All you know is you need to move in that direction. And for you, what you need to do is get on your knees regularly and just say, Lord, would you give me a heart of service that echoes the heart of my King? And the Lord will open up ways for you to do that. You can guarantee it won't make you look good. It won't make you look big. It won't be done in the eyes of other people, but in the eyes of heaven, it is you being made well again. One person put it this way, true transformation of the world and of us will only happen as we are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. This Jesus, 
with a towel. As his way becomes our way, as his source of power becomes our source, and his patterns of life become our patterns. And in fact, he pushes it further at the end. He gives us the diagnosis while some of you are so stuck. Uh Uh-oh, Steve, you're going to go there. Well, Jesus does. Look at the end. Verse 16, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. That idea of being blessing is being put back together, um, knowing the mercy of God, renewing you, transforming you, bringing you grace. He's telling us here, by default, that the opposite can be true. If you are stuck... It could be it's because you've been serving all right yourself. You're so caught up in your own junk. You've told yourself things along the lines of, well, I've got this and I'm facing that and I couldn't possibly and I'm not. And the Lord comes and says, take a step out in faith with me. Serving makes you well. Oh, it wears you out. So you have to depend upon him. His way, you think about, I'm going to be really cautious in saying that. You think about the people in our congregation who are the most well put together. And you will find if you draw a graph, my background is in mathematics, that those who are the most well put together are the ones who are serving the most. What does that tell you? It tells you, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So it could be for some of you, you need to lay down your excuses, you need to look again at Jesus and say, not only have you covered my shame, you are showing me the way that I'm to live. Paul Tripp put it this way, grace relentlessly pursues, relentlessly forgives, relentlessly transforms, and relentlessly restores, all of which we relentlessly need. We do, don't we? We need to be made new by Christ. And I'm so thankful that I'm in a church where you guys aren't going to fight me on that. Because actually many of you are the example to me in that. I'm so thankful that we have got a disproportionately high number of people in this church who have put off worldly gain and are seeking to just give away to a community that doesn't want us doesn't really care if we weren't here and when we start to tell them about Jesus they put up all kinds of fronts but this is who you are in this strange period he said get rid of your gowns don't worry about what the world says use this time to be part of my kingdom advancement many won't thank you but the eyes of heaven will see you and you will be blessed if you do these things We're going to sing about his vision for us, asking that he would be our vision. We're only going to